drug dosing, uh, already to drug dosing uh, in the previous talks, uh, um, it came up, the, the topic, and uh, Jason is an expert in drug dosing, clinical pharmacist working in the ICU, so you have the floor. Thanks, Eric, and thanks to the organisers for the opportunity to speak to you today about something that I'm very passionate about, and that's making sure that pharmacotherapy for critically ill patients is optimal, such that uh, our intensive therapy can be delivered with maximal efficiency. So I'm going to be speaking, it's a very nice way to finish the session, I think, to be uh, talking about drug dosing in renal replacement therapy. It's quite a, a complicated area and uh, one that I'll try and walk through uh, with some detail and hopefully at the end of it you'll understand a lot of the concepts that, I'm, uh, that are important to uh, ensuring that patients receive optimal doses. They're just some disclosures for me. Uh, so this is the outline of what I intend to discuss and I'll try and move through in a timely manner so that everyone can get to their, their coffee break in time. But uh, to talk a little bit about, uh, uh, give an introduction to the topic essentially and just to let you know that I'm really going to focus on antibiotics and uh, I'll explain why that is a little bit later on. But I, I think it's a, these are the class of drugs whereby drug dosing is, is a lot more challenging because we don't have a clinical effect that we can of course titrate doses to with these per se. Uh, talk a little bit about different renal replacement therapies uh, and how they're relevant to clearance and removal of, of drug compounds and this is important of course for understanding why you would adjust doses in this context. And then the challenges of predicting pharmacokinetics and then to provide a framework from which in an individual case scenario how you can use pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic principles to guide drug dosing. So I don't want to go into too much detail really from an introduction perspective other than to say that infection is common in renal replacement therapy and when it is present it's associated with a 50% increased likelihood of death. Uh, and so this uh, could mean one of two things. Firstly that these patients are, are sicker than their non-infected equivalents or alternatively that we aren't using very good antibiotic dosing in these patients. And so because we're not using appropriate dosing, they're dying of these infections as opposed to just with antibiotics. Uh, one of the things which has come through in a lot of the discussions and as well as the questions that were being raised by Marlies before is that you know, the way that people perform renal replacement therapy is different everywhere. You know, we have different modalities. We've got the intermittent modalities, the hybrid modalities like SLED, as well as the different forms of continuous modalities. And the different doses of the renal replacement therapy that are used in those different modalities means that you're getting differential solute clearance with each of these and over a different time frame as well. And so for us to think that, well, what dose of uh, antibiotic do we use for a form of renal replacement therapy and use a fixed dose in that context really isn't something that makes any sense at all because you're going to get variable clearance depending on how you use that renal replacement therapy. And so a fixed approach to dosing is something which really doesn't make sense and it, this means that it's very important for us to look at a lot of detail about what we're using locally in our own institution, what settings, what type of renal replacement therapy, and then to use that to guide what dosing regimens we should be using. Uh, finally, for in terms of dosing information that exists for different drugs during different forms of renal replacement therapy, there really isn't that much. Uh, so it's been estimated that for continuous renal replacement therapy that less than 20% of drugs, so not just antibiotics but drugs generally, have dosing information to provide some sort of guidance about how we should be using these. And for the hybrid modalities like SLED or extended daily dialysis, uh, there are even less, so less than 1% of drugs. So in terms of the different types of renal replacement therapy, this is something which I'm sure you're all aware of, but it just, just to highlight the fact that different sites use different forms of renal replacement therapy and having an understanding of what you use locally is important for you working out what dosing regimens may be more appropriate for an antibiotic for you or for other drugs of course as well because the concepts for antibiotic dosing uh, are relevant for other drugs as well. So the two important concepts which um, I'd like to highlight initially are the, those of dialysis and filtration. So these are two different principles by which you can have clearance of solute uh, with a renal replacement therapy treatment. So dialysis of course is diffusion uh, and this is where there's a concentration gradient that exists between the blood and the dialysate and you get movement of the drug across that concentration gradient. 
Filtration relies on the process of convection, whereby there's a pressure gradient across the filter, and that pressure gradient pushes um, water, but as well as solute across the, uh, the membrane. And that's typically used for fluid removal, but because you get movement of solute as well, you tend to get um, significant clearance of solute too. And of course, there's dye filtration as well, whereby it's a combination of both diffusion and convection. Now, the relevance of this will come through on some of the later slides when I provide some of the specific data, but essentially, you have different, um, the dialysis itself tends to clear smaller molecules than uh, what convection is also able to, to clear. You tend to get a greater clearance of solute with, an, um, with a, a dose of uh, renal replacement therapy, which is a, a filtration approach. And with dye filtration, you, because you've got both processes occurring, you tend to get an even larger clearance of solute again. So these are some slides that I, um, I try to use wherever I can. They were developed by a, a very good friend of mine, Jeff Lipman, and he uh, tells me it took him hours to prepare this, and so I think the more time that I get to show this to people, the more reward he gets for all of his uh, hard efforts. But anyway, this is hemodialysis. You can see we have a concentration gradient in the, uh, at the blood side where you can see the, the blood flow, and then it just the solutes move across the membrane and then are cleared via the effluent. For hemofiltration, we've got the, the water as well, which you'll see because of the high transmembrane pressure, you get movement of water as well as solute across that membrane. So with this introduction, I hope it's quite clear that uh, we're not going to have very consistent pharmacokinetics for drugs in different forms of renal replacement therapy. And so I wanted to outline some of these challenges of predicting pharmacokinetics. So, Dosing drugs in uh, this context is something which is very important. Now, I haven't really gone into much detail about whether or not you are getting the, the dose of renal replacement therapy delivered, but that's a very important concept, and particularly in the context of whether or not there's been filtered downtime because of clotting, and that whereas you may think that you're having 24 hours of clearance of a, of a compound or of solute, it may be that with clotting that may only be 16 or 12 hours that's actually occurring. And so, if anything, you've got a, a form of sustained low efficiency or dialysis or, or SLED which is being used. And so being aware of this filter downtime is something which is really important for understanding what you should be doing with your ongoing dosing of a drug. But certainly, these patients are very sick. You saw the mortality rates for uh, patients with severe sepsis receiving uh, renal replacement therapy can be as high as 65%. And so this means that it's very important for us to be achieving optimal therapy. As I referred to before, many drugs uh, can be titrated to some measurable clinical effect, but that's not the case for antibiotics. You know, we can't measure a, a mean arterial pressure and be titrating the infusion of an antibiotic to a particular target like that. We can't measure blood sugar levels like we can for um, insulin or um, measures of anticoagulation for anticoagulants as well. Uh, the changes that it takes to see an effect of antibiotics in terms of changes of the severity of infection can take 24, 48, even 72 hours if we're effective. And if we're waiting that long to find out that the dose isn't right, it's not really appropriate. And so that's why this really um, intrinsic understanding of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics is really important to make sure that these patients are receiving early and optimal uh, therapy. And so having a knowledge of the the settings, the modalities, as well as the filter compliance with renal replacement therapy is very important and all adds to the dosing complexities in renal replacement therapy. So now I want to spend uh, some time talking about PKPD, so pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and how this can be used to guide dosing. So in terms of a structure that I would suggest that people consider for, for this would be to break it down into to three different elements. <coughs> Firstly, to understand what is the pharmacokinetics of the antibiotic that's being prescribed. Secondly, what is the pharmacodynamic index and the pathogen susceptibility. And then thirdly, what is the extent of the um, acute kidney injury? Are they aneuric? Do they have some level of residual re uh, urine output? And what are the types of renal replacement therapy and the settings? Now, we'll go each through each one of these categories uh, sequentially. So the pharmacokinetics of the chosen antibiotic. So this is where it's important to have an understanding of those pharmacokinetic characteristics. What is its volume of distribution? How is it cleared from the body? So if it is a volume of distribution which is quite small, then that means it's 
more likely to be a, a hydrophilic drug, which typically has renal clearance, and therefore if it has renal clearance, there's a high likelihood that renal replacement therapy is going to have a significant effect on the, the clearance of this drug, and therefore the dosing requirements. If it's a very large volume of distribution, that tends to mean that less of the drug is actually present in the bloodstream, and so it's not interacting with the renal replacement therapy modality as much to be cleared from it, and so it's less likely that it's going to have an effective clearance there. What are its clearance routes? Well, of course, if a drug is primarily hepatically cleared, then that's an indication to you, of course, that the clearance that's going to occur with renal replacement therapy will be less. To further uh, understand this, um, we could look at the molecular size of the drug, the level of protein binding, as well as the pathophysiological effects on pharmacokinetics of that compound. And trying to bring each of these together for an individual drug is what's required to make sure that we make a better choice of dose for our patient. So looking specifically at uh, molecular size, so as I referred to before, that traditionally hemodialysis tends to clear smaller molecules, less than 1,000 Daltons. Um, it can be um, larger than this now with some of our, the high flux membranes that exist, but certainly as a traditional uh, uh, teaching, that would be what would be the case. Whereas with hemofiltration, with the pressure gradient that exists, you tend to be able to drive larger molecules across the filter, and so you tend to get larger molecules that are, are cleared. So if we look at the uh, molecular size of some of the common antibiotics, with tycoplanin being up the top there, being quite a, a large molecule with a molecular weight close to 2,000 Daltons, compared with some of the beta-lactams and amino glycosides, which are closer to, to 500 Daltons, then you can see that in the presence of uh, hemodialysis, that it's going to clear that the smaller molecules, whereas hemofiltration has a, is much more likely to clear the larger and the smaller molecules. I've got vancomycin as an example there because it's a commonly used drug, has quite a large molecular weight, and you'll know that traditionally with intermittent hemodialysis modalities, that you get very poor clearance of vancomycin with intermittent hemodialysis because of its molecular size, although this is changing a little bit with some of the high flux membranes that exist. Protein binding is another important uh, concept to be aware of, and that's because it's only the unbound concentration of drug that can be cleared. Albumin uh, as a serum protein is quite a large uh, molecule, and so by having a, a drug bound to that, that means that that, that drug is essentially um, present in that, with that uh, other large molecule, and therefore it won't be cleared across the membrane. So if you have a drug which has high protein binding, then it has a low unbound concentration, which means that the overall clearance of that drug relative to that total concentration is going to be quite low. So for drugs like clindamycin, tycoplanin, keftriaxone, which have uh, protein <coughs> bindings greater than 80 to 85 percent, you tend to not see very significant clearance of these drugs uh, with renal replacement therapy because of this high protein binding. Whereas for other drugs, such as meropenem, uh, the other beta-lactams, which are, have low protein binding, you tend to see quite high clearance of these drugs. Because there's more unbound concentration, there's more that are available to be cleared across the, the membrane. And this brings us to the sieving coefficient, which essentially is a way to define the, the likelihood that a drug is going to pass across the uh, hemofilter. And it's defined as the concentration of drug in the ultrafiltrate over the concentration in the plasma. And so if you have a similar concentration in the ultrafiltrate versus the plasma, that means that you're getting a lot of movement of drug across the, the hemofilter. And so a drug with a sieving coefficient close to one has quite high clearance. So here on this graphic here, you can see that we have um, the fraction unbound. So the, the higher the unbound fraction, that means the lower the protein binding versus the sieving coefficient. And as you can see here, each of these drugs here have relatively high drug clearance because they have um, a high unbound fraction. Whereas for drugs like keftraxone, which I referred to before, uh, cyclosporin, phenytoin, you know, these are drugs with a, a larger volume of distribution and or uh, protein binding, which means you get less clearance of these drugs across a hemofilter. And so the need for dose adjustment with these drugs is decreased. And so we can then define what the sieving coefficients are for various antibiotics as we have on here. And as you'd expect, that drugs which are um, a smaller molecular size, are hydrophilic, as well as have low protein binding, tend to have the largest sieving coefficients and are much more likely to be cleared to a significant extent, as you can see uh, from this graphic here, whereby we have on the x-axis the sieving coefficient and the various different drugs on the y-axis.
ceftriaxone, ticoplanin, and oxacillin, drugs with very high protein binding, have very low serine coefficients because of that protein binding. What about the effect of sickness severity? Well, it wouldn't be a, a, a very good talk if I didn't in some way reference um, Jean-Louis Vincent, and so I've uh, had to do that here. But uh, this is, uh, uh, it tries to articulate the importance of sickness severity and that the sicker the patient is, the more likely it is that we have had to administer significant amounts of fluids as part of the resuscitation process. And with those extra fluids that the patient has on board, that if this is a hydrophilic drug, whereby it uh, um, solubilizes in water and there's more water that's present in the body, then of course you're going to see a lower concentration. What that means, of course, is if you are to give that same person the same dose of drug in a state whereby they have received lots of fluid resuscitation as opposed to not, then when they've had lots of fluid resuscitation, the concentration of that drug will be lower. And that's where this concept of loading doses and front-loaded doses uh, emerge because we need to give higher doses initially because of that extra volume of distribution that these patients have. In this study here, which is part of the beta-lactam therapeutic drug monitoring program that is, is run at a, a RASME hospital, you can see here that um, there's two different profiles for both piperacillin and keftazidine. Uh, the first profile is the, the concentration of drugs for a cohort of patients within the first 48 hours. Uh, sorry, this is the lower concentration here. And the higher concentration is for that which is uh, subsequent to that. And you can see here that essentially the concentrations increase over time. And that what that means, if, and if we look at what these target concentrations are that we're aiming for here, that if we don't use higher doses initially, we're not going to achieve early effective antibiotic concentrations. And so this means that we should be using higher doses initially and then use lower doses later on, which just cater purely for the clearance because the volume of distribution has been satisfied with that initial dosing. Uh, this concept has been shown for many other drugs as well. I, I highlight in particular fluconazole, which is a very, very interesting drug in the context of uh, renal replacement therapy. Fluconazole in patients with normal renal function has a half-life of about 24 hours, and that's because there's a lot of tubular reabsorption of this drug that occurs after it's been filtered in the kidney. As soon as you use renal replacement therapy, this tubular reabsorption can't occur. And so essentially, that which has been uh, filtered just gets cleared. And so fluconazole actually requires higher doses in renal replacement therapy than is required in patients with normal renal function. And so our practice is to increase doses by 50% in these patients for this drug. And this is a concept which also exists for colistin as well. And really does guard against us assuming that there is a, a particular glomerular filtration rate which is uh, appropriate for dosing <coughs> drugs uh, with a type of renal replacement therapy. The pharmacodynamic index is something which is very important. You'll know that for a lot of our antibiotics that we've very nicely characterised what the pharmacodynamic kill characteristics of these are. They can be categorised as time dependent, concentration dependent, or a mixture of the two, which we define in terms of AUC, MIC. And you'll see across each of those that really the MIC is that most important denominator, which defines what pharmacokinetic exposure of drug is required for effect. For the time dependent drugs, we want to maintain a concentration consistently throughout the dose interval as a, as a desired uh, pharmacokinetic profile, whereas with the concentration-dependent drugs, that, like the aminoglycosides, a high peak concentration is important. So if you think about the importance of the MIC, is that that really does define what your pharmacokinetic exposure is, and so a knowledge of that MIC is important. If you assume that the MIC is at, a, at the break point, and say in the case of uh, uh, piperacil and tazobactam, that the MIC is 16, where at the concentration of drug that's required for optimal effects against uh, organism of 16 as opposed to if you do measure it and you find that it's 2 or 4 is a lot different. And so knowledge of the MIC is something which is important but of course is, is difficult to get in day-to-day -day practice but it does influence what your choice of dose may be. And then the extent of AKI and then the type of renal replacement therapies is that final consideration for um, dosing. So uh, the level of renal, uh, residual renal output is something which is important uh, and because if someone has um, a significant level of, uh, of, of urine production, then this can be an extra mechanism for clearance of drug and so having knowledge of what level of uh, urine output is in a patient 
uh, is important because it may mean that you need a higher dose of drug. And this has been shown in a number of recent studies now that uh, with an increase in urine output with for patients that are on renal replacement therapy, that they need higher doses. This graphic here is meant to just summarise the different types of uh, considerations, and it's really in the context of the type of renal replacement therapy, the renal replacement therapy settings, as well as the drug factors, and a lot of those that we've, we've discussed so far. But just um, considering the interplay of each of these is something which is important. Uh, I want to make some comments about um, uh, what, we, what data there is supporting each of these different elements. So firstly, an understanding of uh, pre-dilution versus post-dilution is important. You can see here on this graphic here from a very good review paper from 2009 in Critical Care Medicine from some uh, local Hong Kong uh, intensivists that if you have post-dilution that you will have a much more concentrated uh, uh, blood volume which is passing across the haemophilter and so you're likely to get higher clearance of drug than you would if you've got pre-filter dilution that occurs. Looking at the um, importance of effluent flow rate, that this was a, a meta-aggression that was done by our group looking at a series of different studies and what the clearance of meropen and piperacillin vancomycin was with different effluent flow rates and we could see that it was actually quite a strong predictor of drug clearance. In terms of hemodialysis, uh, dialysate flow rate is something which is very important uh, and it has been shown to be very nicely correlated with drug clearance as well. And so that's a bit of an indicator if you use hemodialysis about the level of drug clearance that's likely. For hemodiafiltration and trying to understand the effects of that versus hemofiltration, there was a series of studies that was done by Valtonin et al. in the early 2000s. And I've got three different drugs summarised here, piperacillin, meropenem and fluconazole, comparing the clearance of each of these drugs with hemofiltration versus increasing flow rates of uh, CVVH-DF. And essentially, uh, the CVVH-DF um, has a much greater clearance of drug than with the haemofiltration alone, and that as you increase the dose of that, then you tend to see a further increased clearance as well. The final study that I wanted to describe was looking at equidoses of haemofiltration versus haemodiafiltration. This study was from a clinical trial looking at haemofiltration versus haemodiafiltration in French intensive care units, and there was an opportunistic pharmacokinetic study that was conducted as part of that. And uh, data was obtained for ciprofloxacin, caspofungin, and amikacin, and what was found is that generally that the haemodiafiltration had a, a higher clearance than the haemofiltration, but the overall pharmacokinetic variability that existed mean, meant that that uh, didn't reach statistical significance, and that was consistent for all of the drugs, which means that um, provides another complexity to dosing. Finally, on uh, uh, hybrid forms of dialysis, as uh, Jean-Louis alluded to before, this is very difficult to work out how to dose drugs in this context. Uh, essentially, if it's a concentration-dependent drug, well, that's beneficial because you can use the dialysis to dramatically reduce the concentration of these drugs, so you're less likely to see toxicity after achieving a nice peak concentration. But for uh, co time-dependent drugs, and there's a recent study that's come out from Germany with keftazidine, it makes things very difficult because if you're using consistent dosing through the day but you've got inconsistent clearance, then really that's something which isn't necessarily going to work. And so you need to think about giving supplemental doses post or during SLED to supplement concentrations. So in conclusion, uh, I hope I've convinced you that this is a very complicated area, but if you think about it in a lot of detail, that it is something which is very possible to make very rational uh, decisions on what doses should be used in individual patients. Um, I think it would be re remiss of me not to say that uh, if you have access to therapeutic drug monitoring, then this is actually the easiest thing to do because if you know what the pharmacokinetic is in the individual patient, then it can tell you what sort of dosing you need. Uh, and I think I'll just conclude there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. Great talk. Um, questions from the floor? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the whole idea of extended and continuous infusions is uh, something which 
is more valuable for patients that have higher drug clearances because essentially you're less likely to have lower concentrations later on in the dose interval. Um, what has been shown for some recent randomised controlled trials, which were pharmacokinetic studies in renal replacement therapy for piperacillin and meropenem, that you do get sustained higher concentrations as you'd expect with continuous infusion, but it's all dose dependent. So if you use a high dose, like they did in a high dose of drug, like they did in those studies, then you end up with sufficient concentrations regardless of how you give them. Uh, if you are to use a, a lower dose, of course, then continuous infusion is much more likely to give you a better exposure. It, 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 yes, but it's all dose dependent, you know. So if you, because there's not as much clearance occurring, then that means that uh, unless you have, as you say, a multi-drug resistant organism with a high MIC, then it's less important actually to do it in that sort of patient as opposed to someone with retained renal function, which is quite like bordering uh, augmented renal clearance. Okay, thank you very much. I think um, we have to conclude because According to the program, we have to restart already, so that's, uh, that's not possible, of course. We have 20 minutes of, uh, of coffee break, so um, we come back uh, at um, uh, 10.25, then uh, it's uh, 10.25. And then uh, we have some case discussions in which we uh, would like to have uh, your input. Uh, okay, thank you very much. <laughs>